Good morning and bienvenidos a Barcelona. My name is Savannah Peterson, joined here with Dave Vellante. We are on day four of our live coverage here on theCUBE at Mobile World Rockin'. Congress. We're excited. Yeah. <laughs> developers, developers, developers. <laughs> We're bringing the heat, and we've got two fantastic guests joining us with a very interesting and exciting partnership. We're going to go real deep on the tech side, so for all you nerds, you're going to want to tune into this one. We've got Dave and Shuja. Thank you both for being here on the show. How are you guys feeling, Dave, for? Uh, I'm feeling great. I mean, first of all, you know, we were here last year, right? On, on this Welcome very back. stage. Yep. And uh, I think, actually, the mood's even improved further. It's like, I think last year, everybody was back from COVID and there were, it was relief. This year, you actually feel palpable energy, enthusiasm for the, inter, uh, for the industry, which is nice, right? And I think part of that's being driven by the AI everywhere. Like, it's just, like, you can't escape it. I mean, there's robots attacking you in the aisles. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's literally, there's like all sorts of hovercraft <laughs> and things like that going around. But it's, a, that's, but, that's but it's, it's, I think people are seeing a future state, right? It's, it's allowing them to sort of break away from, you know, because clearly telcos have a heritage in infrastructure and being sort of hidebound in these, in these big boxes and things like that, and big iron, right? And now the, the AI is sort of giving this, this idea of this horizontal, lightweight, loosely coupled future, much more intelligence and contextual. So I think that's generating a lot of excite excitement on the floor. Right? I hadn't really thought of AI as felt, but that was a nice, <laughs> nice way of putting it. What about for you, Shuja? Yeah, I mean, as Dave said about the, about the AI, is pretty much the hype this year. We have done a lot of work from our side as well in order to prepare since last year to this year to bring in AI story across every single portfolio uh, technology as well as work across the partner ecosystem in order to look at the use cases uh, at the areas where we can jointly collaborate and deliver some value to the customers. So yeah. it, it has been pretty exciting so far, uh, a lot of good partnership and collaboration and relationship across the whole broader par partner ecosystem and some really good demos and demonstration that could actually weave into the way of 5G monetization and other areas where telcos might be interested in. One, such a hot topic there with monetization. We'll dive into that in a second. Dave, can you tell us a little bit more about the partnership here? Oh yeah, actually, absolutely. So we were here last year with Azar from Red Hat, and you know we talked yeah. about Telco SuperCloud. Yes, that, that, that was fun. we love talking yeah. SuperCloud. And, and we got we got a whole new uh, demo to talk about a presentation we're doing uh, here at uh, MWC 24. But you know this is actually a long running collaboration. We actually collaborated with Red Hat on the very first Etsy NFV proof of concept, right? In 2013, right? Back in 2013, wow. we were already demonstrating event-driven, model-based cool. poly control automation using graphs and agents, and nobody knew what I was talking about. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, things take time. To, but now, again, AI is here, and I think our story can be absorbed better. I mean, we've been succeeding through the industry, but now I really can see, feel the wind behind our back because, you know, because people want contextuality, because people want personalized experiences, because people want to optimize, well, they want to optimize their infrastructure too, right? Low energy, right? Uh, you know, uh, low latency, right? This is, gonna, is another generation of technology, right? That's delivering this. And Enterprise Web's going to be part of that. But our uh, the collaboration with Red Hat's very natural because you can just very simply state it is Enterprise Web Platform's the application layer. Red Hat's the infrastructure layer. Together, it's unified network and service management. Right? I mean, we literally weave together so nicely, right? At all aspects of across from uh, OpenShift, Ansible, uh, you know, there's just so many points. I don't know if you want to bring in some of the others. Right, yeah. I mean, as Dave said, let's call it AI-powered super cloud yes. <laughs> with the joint collaboration. So, so Red Hat vision is uh, build once, deploy everywhere, and operate autonomously. And we have a vision of uh, open hybrid cloud uh, powered by, by AI. We have done a lot of work with our partner ecosystem horizontally and vertically in order all the way from silicon at, at the OEM level uh, to the networking stack, to the switching fabric, go up in the layer at the application layer with our workload providers, and especially the one theme that is very common here uh, and, uh, is the abstraction layer because now you have this multiple operating model, multiple operating systems, uh, multiple uh, different cloud environments, uh, as well as different uh, silo automation that is going on in different areas of the business, so IT, network, cloud. Uh, I think that the foremost important piece is the abstraction layer. How do you abstract all of that underneath in order to expose that to a common and unified platform? And that's where our, uh, our partnership has evolved, as Dave said, about starting from the early days of NFV and our mission and orchestration into more meaningful uh, and focused AI-powered abstraction layer that could actually serve the purpose across 
means the, the GSMA open gateway with the open APIs as well as the common layer of service management and orchestration that is being talk of the town in the open RAN business or 5G core edge and the data center. So I think our partnership has grown up as well as our technology stack has actually grown up um, and plus we have some uh, future vision in order to deliver some of that common theme across uh, the next generation of uh, the telco cloud. So let's get into that a little bit. You're talking, you're talking graph and graph ops here at the yep. show. You know, traditionally you think about graph databases, they've been used inside of places like security. Yep. Um, they've not been widely applicable in the enterprise because you, while they're expressive, they're really hard to query. You don't get that simplicity of query that you get with SQL. Yep. So you actually have to go yeah. back 10 or 15 years to query graph databases. That's beginning to change. It sounds like you've got, I really want to hear more about your, your applying, I mentioned security. Yeah. It sounds like the network can really benefit from yep. graph and graph ops. Can you explain that? And yep. then, I, I actually, Dave, want to get into what that means for the enterprise, yep. you know, outside of telco, but let's, yeah. we're here, no. so let's no, start no, with we're, we're right back to abstraction. It's yeah, yeah. a subject we talk about all the time. Right. And I think, uh, if you really think about it, in software, abstraction equals power, right? When you build silos, you build use cases. You build static things, right? And every time you build a static silo thing, it's your, it's the next problem you have for interoperability and end-to-end -end automation and global visibility. When you have abstractions, you're essentially going over the top, right? And that's what we originally talked about, super cloud, yep. right? So uh, you're spot on regarding graph, right? The history of uh, graph, graph goes back to Aristotle, right? And objects <laughs> and things. So this yeah. has a, a, a little, little bit of long, history. A little bit of history, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, I, mean, I thought I was an industry yeah. historian, yeah. Yeah. wow. No, in, math, <laughs> in, in mathematics, it goes back to uh, 1736, uh, Bridges of Konigsberg, Theory, seriously, <laughs> uh, no joke. Love uh, this knowledge but, right but, now. Uh, but <laughs> in in the last ten years or so, the graphs that most people know about, the semantic web, label property graphs, RDF kind of things like that, triples, those are really uh, data graphs for data scientists and data analytics. They are not operational databases. Right. And I think. People are looking to graphs because yeah. they see graphs and they see flexibility, they see things that you can analyze very quickly and they want to bring that in, but there's an impedance mismatch. A graph database as is practiced by Semantic Web, they're great for what they do, that's their use case, but they're not going to be, a, so Enterprise Web is using something called Hypergraph. So we actually have, we just got an announcement of our 21st awarded US patent. So we have 21 awarded patents on the use of. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it is exciting and expensive, by the way. Yeah, um, <laughs> but, sure uh, is. Yeah. You know, you know, it's a couple million I could spent on other things. More claims, yeah. yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, hypergraphs essentially are an abstraction of graph itself. Essentially, enterprise web, instead of actually building a graph database, which actually, as the complexity of your objects and the complexity of your domain grows, you have to, you were saying, shard it over a lot of databases, and then you have this, uh, your reads and your writes become much more expensive and you have these problems called uh, cascading update problems. Mm. I mean, they're real fundamental problems. They're roadblocks to using it for anything real time. Enterprise web essentially is almost like old fashioned list processing. If you're Lisp, like li from the 1950s, McCarthy, right? <laughs> Where essentially enterprise web is just like, like a long skinny table and we actually project the graphs. Instead of having a database that models a graph physically, we actually just run as rows and what we have is tags on the rows, and those tags are relationships. And what we could do is we can read those tags and project graphs and say, okay, in this context, these things are related. In another context, these things are related. And what it means is that we're always interpreting the graph based on the moment, the context of the moment. Enterprise Web is driven by that. There's nothing else Enterprise Web does. It says there's a request, a query, or a command for something. It's coming from Dave. It's coming, yeah, it's, and it's coming in from, where, from Barcelona. It's coming with what's called your in-band metadata. And we take that little bit of in-band metadata, and then we throw that against, the, we use that to sort of bootstrap a walk across the rest of our graph. And then we say, we know all these other things about Dave Vellante. Let's bring those into bear, and we'll apply security, we'll apply all these policies, and we'll bring it down and say, here, in 200 milliseconds, Dave, is a completely personalized response to you. If it was for Shujar, in the response, and he asked the same question, but in his context, in his role, he, his response might be completely different. So you infer different. that metadata, infer from that metadata, and now you can apply AI to, to do a lot of that heavy lifting. Uh, yeah, and actually we can work very like, sympathetically with AI too, because graphs naturally work with AI, because uh, if you think it, uh, if you have a SQL st uh, a siloed solution and a uh, hierarchical rigid database, 
it's hard for the AI to really roam that, right? But graphs are based on relationships. And because we're a hypergraph or multidimensional, we can expose that graph through an API to AI or to LLMs, right? And they can essentially walk our graphs because what is a, any form of AI is looking for patterns. They're just different methods to detect patterns. Well, relationships help you identify patterns. So the yeah. uh, our, so we're sort of on the deterministic, logic-based side, driving those real-time operations, and then we could work with AI to get those higher-level inferences. So a good example is last year, after MWC 23, we met with Microsoft, and when we, a few months later, in May of last year, we demonstrated the world's first telco-grade generative AI for intent-based orchestration. Nobody else, we are actually- Casual. Yeah, yeah, so we did that directly with Microsoft Telecom, we were the first people in the world to actually show that telco grade orchestration with an, with an LLM, right? And uh, it's nine months, it's almost a year later, and nobody else has matched it yet, right? It's, it's partially because of our design choices, it's our architecture. Enterprise Web is really sort of suited for this moment, for this AI enabled, intelligent, real time. Yeah. You know, 10 years ago, people thought I was crazy. But now I think, you know, like, you know, who's going to want that? Do you feel vindicated? Uh, Do you feel validated uh, yeah, now? I, 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 I am. Dave, I don't think 10 years ago people thought you were crazy, uh, uh, other than the fact that they thought what you were trying to do was impossible, so maybe they thought you were crazy for trying uh. to solve that problem. But, uh. but there, it, 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 it's a real problem, right? And, and you think about, <clears throat> well, you think about packaged apps like SAP or, or Oracle. They define how you have to operate. Yep. And they essentially, like you call them, I think, use cases. Yep. And that use case is, all the data is locked inside of that use case. So what are the advancements in software technology, this is what you're at the forefront of, mm -hmm. that are allowing you, enabling you to, to span, to abstract across yep. those environments okay. so that you, you can now have a, a, a more logical layer of your business, a representation yep. of your business. Can you describe yep. that technology? So how much time do we have? <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, so, you know, uh, so in short, so Enterprise Web, it's really, you have to almost back it up for a second. You could, uh, 10 years ago, you could see distributed systems coming, right? Even before the cloud, right? Cloud's not to 2012, 13, right? And that's still nascent, right? Yeah. right. Kubernetes is not to 2016. We think it's been around forever, but 2016, that's not that long ago, right? right. Um, but you could see as the industry was fragmenting, right, and uh, systems were getting, people and systems and information were getting distributed. In a distributed system, it's just uh, logical, and this was my original sort of insight that it, uh, why I founded, the, the motivation to found the company, was to say, you know, actually, in a distributed system, you don't want to build silos. Silos are going to be just pain points for interoperability and change, and we're just going to be exacerbating all our problems when we go to the cloud in a, if we keep our silos. You want a horizontal abstraction over the top. You want, even though the world is increasingly dynamic, distributed, and diverse, you'd like one layer where you could say, hey, all these objects look the same to me. And in this place, I know they're unique, I know they're all snowflakes, but in this place, they've been modeled, mapped to a DSL, they've been mapped to this graph, and I can look at them in the same way. I can discover them the same way. I can compose them declaratively, and I can deploy them and manage them with central policy management. That's really critical. It's a better user experience. Yeah, and what's really happening is that that's all abstraction because in the reality is enterprise web's runtime. Anytime you abstract something, what you're doing is, and we were talking about developers in the beginning, right? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, developers. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so for the developers, right, developers want to, solve business cases, they want to solve business problems, and the way to do that is remove barriers from them. If we can create an abstraction and say, look guys, everything's in a catalog, forget the fact that they might be unique and they have idiosyncrasies and all these details here. Right. In this catalog, you can find anything you need, a router, a switch, whatever else it is, right? I want to go there, I want to compose it into the service that I need to compose for my job, I want to set the SLAs on it, the policies, and then I want to deploy it. I don't want to care about how it runs, I don't want to compare about where it runs. Right. I don't want to, I want to be able to tell the system. I want it to work. I want it to work, I want it to be low latency, I want it to be energy yeah. efficient. And I want the system, so every time you do an abstraction, what you're doing is you're raising the abstraction so the developer can, his tasks are simplified, or his, her, right? They, them, so their tasks are simplified and automated, right? And what you're doing is when you're, you're transferring the burden onto the runtime. The yeah. runtime then takes responsibility. How we do that, we use agents. So Enterprise Web is, so the graph is where we get to the model, and the execution, the runtime of Enterprise Web is completely agent-based. Enterprise Web is a serverless runtime, it's, our own, it's part of our patents, we are our, it's not Amazon Lambda, it's our own implementation of serverless, which just means that 
we have these agents that live inside our graph as well, and every time something, as we were talking about, there's a, a query or command, we just fan out agents to like customize that response for you. So I must imagine if you went to the car wash and 20 guys came out to hand wash your car, right? They just come out of the building and they just swarm your car and they just do, and then they're gone. And then they're on the next car, right? What we have is this, this swarm of agents that come out, they do the task they need to do, and then they go away. They're completely stateless. There's no long running threads, there's no long running sessions. So if you look about- You don't have to manage them. Yeah. Right? You don't have yeah. to manage them as, a, as, a, as, a, no, as no, an as a IT developer. person or yeah, a developer. Yeah, because right? Enterprise Web is doing right. it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, if I may add, just to, to build on top, because everything has to run on the infrastructure, right? Uh, in the past, 10 years ago, was not a common vision across people, processes, and a platform. There is some harmonization, but now I would say there is more broader understanding of this common and unified platform across every single environment, because today, you could see that there's a lot of edge deployment that are happening, edge private 5G, that you have this uh, core, uh, core network, then you have the data center, now this open run has come in. So there are different set of technologies, different set of environments across any cloud, public cloud, multi-cloud, uh, you have this small application cloud. All these environments are ac actually getting mixed. So now you, you need that form of uniqueness across your infrastructure layer, you need that uh, same uniqueness across uh, your, your, yeah, your abstraction layer, your, your graph ops, as you explained, you want this single pane of glass that could actually provide you the capability and ability uh, across any single environment. And that's where Red Hat brings in the technology that actually goes all the way from device edge in a small box uh, to, the, to the core and the data center, uplift, enable some of those technologies which we have integrated successfully with enterprise web uh, graph ops in order to bring in this capability of uh, OpenShift AI, for example, some of the AI tools, in order to train the model, in order to deploy the model, in order to continue this reinforcement. So, so all those capabilities that has actually been added in the platform in order to uplift and enhance the user experience on top. Um, this is where the partnership's really starting to come into focus, because essentially you're, <coughs> you're an yeah. integration layer across legacy applications. You're, yep. you're taking what we're you know, previously islands of automation, and yes. you're 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 spanning those. Right. Now I can automate my entire business, so I can now. We're, we're seeing the days where you can get a digital representation of your your business in real time. Yep. People, you know, George yeah. and we talk about this yeah. all the time. People, yep. places, and things. You know, yep. Uber for the enterprise. Imagine, yep. yeah. imagine an Uber-like experience, except it's your enterprise. Yeah. Right. right. Everything yep. that's happening, and you got your agents swarming. Yeah. And then leaving, and then that's a fun. And then, yeah. fun and then you've got the, the 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 graph representing that business. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And right. so it's maintaining the state of the business too, right? Which is another thing that graph databases wouldn't do naturally, right? right? right. Because you need the when you're dealing with that kind of complexity, you're literally managing the state of every user interaction, every system interaction, yeah. every function deployed function. You're managing a lot of com so. The, the runtime takes a lot of responsibility to man manage the consistency across all the partners. So everybody looking at an object at any given time, state has to be consistent, right? So you, Absolutely. But, but that's, that should be lifted up from the developer, right? It's, it's just too much, right? The, the fact is, you know, the demand for integration and interoperability and new applications is going through the roof, right? They humans don't scale like that well, right? We need to make it easier for developers to do these tasks, right? So they can deliver, the, del, uh, deliver uh, accelerate service delivery, right? Deliver new products to market faster, uh, connect their end-to-end -end solutions, you know, um, and evolve them over time, right? The graph, it's another thing about graph. Just like your social graph on LinkedIn, right? We're connected yeah. on LinkedIn, right? So on LinkedIn, you'd like to think you're only adding people, but you can add people, leave people, right? And just like, you know, you have friends of friends, friends of friends of friends, you have this, there's a graph behind you, yeah. right? And that's, uh, that's evolving with you over time, right? And that's interesting. So Enterprise Web allows you to do that as a business, because that was my original motivation. I am, at my core, a business guy that likes to get technical. I'm not a technical guy, so really? I want. I want. We to haven't noticed. I, no, I, 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 I like. I wanted to solve a business. You're not problem. a technical guy. No, 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 no. <laughs> no. What are you talking about. You know, Bill's yeah. my technical guy, <laughs> my silent partner. <laughs> yeah. um, but the uh, because I wanted. I saw it as a business problem. It's like I actually got mad at that same thing you were talking about. Is the yeah. uh, back in 2010 or so? Uh, I was thinking like, hey, I'm a business guy. I want to look down my people information capabilities. I want to flexibly compose them for a purpose, and I don't want IT to tell me I can't. Yeah. So I yeah. nobody was doing it. So I figured, okay, I'm going to solve this problem. And I did. 
<laughs> and uh, so far, so good. Yeah, you said something while we were getting prepped, and we could go on all day, so we're going to have to wrap this up here in just a second. However, uh, why don't you just have them bring drinks here? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm here for that. Trust a little me. early. For there's, 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 you know, whatever. It, it's day four. We can do, there, there are no rules here. We're in Barcelona. Uh, you mentioned, I, I'm a big fan of The Edge. We've had quite a few great conversations on theCUBE this week about The Edge. Yes. You said that you can do things nobody else can at The Edge. Yes. Explain. Oh, you're gonna you're gonna call me out on that? Okay. Well, now I want to know. <laughs> now I want to know what those so, things are. You okay, teased right, me with right. it before we went live. Okay. So the, the so then it goes down to like the characteristics of our platform itself, right? So we already agree that people want to be real time, intelligent, contextual AI. So we agree. So now imagine if I told you I could do that all in 50 megabytes, and it could run at the core, at the edge, on a device. Woo. Yeah. Our full footprint is 50 megabytes. Where I can actually cut it. Our kernel is only like six or seven. Really? And when I talk about 50 megabytes, that's the entire telco model. So in, that's so the RAM, the core, the transport, layer one through seven, I can reason over that entire space space. That's something nobody else can do. Yeah. Right? And, and see, this is a big thing that we were talking about trapped use cases and stuff like that. AI is all about reasoning, right? It's making intelligent decisions. Like, if you were a doctor, you, you would look at me, if I was on the operating table through the emergency room, you would you would look at me holistically. You wouldn't just say, uh, you know, Dave's got a scratch over here, let me just treat that, and you'd miss the gunshot wound. Right. Or you'd, or you'd neglect to find out that I have allergies to some drugs or some issue. You would want to know my chart. You would, you would actually be managing me. Uh, you'd be checking my blood pressure. You'd be, checking, you'd be taking all these facts in all the time to make sure the actions you take are optimized, right? If you do everything siloed, you've just contained what your decision space is, right? If I'm managing a service or a slice and I'm all the way up here, it's a network service, I want to understand what's the RAN doing, what's the core doing, what's the transport doing, what's my, uh, what are my functions doing, yeah. do I need to dynamic, what do I need to like, configure here and what do I need to configure there to make sure this thing maintains its SLA continuously, right? That's a sort of next level problem. The fact that we could take that and we can bring that down into a, a sub 50 megabyte footprint, Yeah. right? Yeah. That's, that's game changing. Impressive. So. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so you weren't lying to me before <laughs> we started the show. That's awesome. Shuja, Dave, thank you so much for being here thank on the guys. show. Absolutely fantastic always a pleasure. discussion. Always Dave, a pleasure. thank you for always keeping yeah. it entertaining and, and both of us getting technical on graphs here. I love it. <laughs> and thank you all for tuning in to our four days of live coverage here from Mobile World Congress in Barcelona, Spain. My name's Savannah Peterson. You're watching theCUBE, the leading source for enterprise tech news.